On today's episode, we're covering the curious poisoning of Julie Williams. For today's story, we'll be traveling back to March 24th, 1986, and landing towards the edge of the Sonoran Desert. We're rolling into Tempe, Arizona, where the temperatures were hot that day, but something else was even hotter. It's about to get spicy. Let's zoom in on a particular insurance agency called the Transamerica Title Insurance Company, where only four employees worked. The four employees were all friends and spent their work days gabbing, processing paperwork, and doing your typical day-to-day -day office meanderings. You know the workplace gossip is off the chain there. One of the newest employees who worked there was 46-year-old Julie Williams, and she'd been hired two months before. During that time, things were going very well for her. She was happier than she'd been in a while and really enjoyed her job and co-workers. Her daughter said she was really starting to feel a sense of peace and joy after a particularly difficult time in her life. That Monday morning, Julie arrived at the office around 9 a.m. and headed for the break room, grabbing herself a drink from the water cooler. The second she took a sip, she recoiled in pain. She exclaimed that her lips and tongue felt like they were burning and warned her other co-workers not to drink it. Of course she warned her co-workers not to drink it, but us silly humans, the second someone tells us not to do something, what's the one thing we want to do? While Julie hurried off to the bathroom, the co-workers wondered what could be wrong, and some elected to try the water themselves. They grabbed a cup and tried to sip the water, but the second the water hit their tongues, it burned with the heat of a thousand suns, and they spit it out immediately. Convinced something was indeed wrong with the water, and knowing Julie had ingested it, they ran to the bathroom to check on her. In the bathroom, they found one of the stall doors locked, and after they couldn't get an answer from Julie, they attempted to break the door open. But Julie had collapsed, and her body was leaning against the door, making it impossible to open, so her co-workers had to climb over the stall to finally reach her. There, they found Julie completely unresponsive. Paramedics arrived and rushed her to the hospital where she lay in a coma. Doctors told Julie's family to get there quickly because they didn't know what was happening, but that she was going downhill fast. At first, the doctors thought maybe Julie had suffered a massive stroke, but it seemed far worse than that. All the tests and scans on Julie came back to show her brain activity was a flat line and that she most likely wasn't waking up. Julie's three grown daughters were devastated. The brutal part was she really was fine, in the sense that her heart was good, her liver was healthy, her kidneys were functioning, and she could have kept on living like that for years. It was just her brain and the fact that she would never wake up. The employees had told the emergency responders at the office about the water that burned them, and they were like, huh, weird, could we maybe get someone to look at that? So the hospital asked the authorities to check out Transamerica's water supply and sent over an investigator to take samples. The second the investigator walked into the break room, he could smell a particularly bitter odor. If your alarm bells aren't ringing from the word bitter, then are you even a true, true crime fan? Truly? I know our viewers are on it, but just in case you're new to the world of perpetrators, poisonings, and peril, we'll give you a little science lesson. While half of the population wouldn't have smelled anything, there's another half of the population that possesses a very specific and potentially life-saving gene. So you know how there's that weird genetic thing that makes cilantro taste delicious to half of us and like soap to the other half? Same kind of deal. The people that have this particular gene actually can smell the cyanide, and it has been described to have the distinct smell of bitter almonds. The crazy part is, geneticists can only guess that around half of the population have this gene. Because unlike cilantro, it's not a garnish you just toss into a salsa and figure out if you like it or not later. Hopefully none of us will ever have to smell cyanide in our lives, but if you ever get a whiff of bitter almonds, either the almond milk's gone bad or it's time to run. The forensics team decided to bag pretty much everything up for testing, just in case. And that's when they noticed something strange. A lot of the items in the room, such as the mugs, the coffee maker, the creamer, and a few other items appear to have a fine crystallized substance sitting in the bottom of it. Scientists tested the substance and confirmed that the white powder found in the water cooler, as well as around the office, was indeed cyanide. 
They also found a massive amount of cyanide in the office's empty coffee pot. This wasn't no fluke water jug oopsie from the factory. This was an intentionally lethal plan, with backup plans B and C in case no one went for the water cooler first. Five grams of cyanide is enough to take out a full grown adult, and the water cooler was found with 32 grams in it, which is enough to wipe out everyone in the office. But why was the Transamerica Title Company the specific office under attack? And who exactly would want all four employees gone? Ooh, that just gave me a great idea for a movie. With Four seemingly innocent middle-aged women who claim they work for an insurance company, but it's a front. And secretly, they're the top criminal mob bosses in the city or something. Dibs, no one take my idea. But while an office of money laundering mob mommies might explain such a terrifying attack, that simply wasn't the case. These were just regular gals. Nonetheless, Julie was a real person with a family, dreams, fears, and goals, just like any of us. And one person's selfish actions took that away from her in a matter of seconds. Only 48 hours after Julie walked into work on that seemingly mundane Monday morning, her daughters had to make the difficult decision to take their own mother off of life support. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know if I could do it. If I had to take my mom off of life support, I would just go with her. When the investigators found out just how much cyanide was in the coffee pot and water cooler, they were shocked that the other three workers weren't met with the same fate. It seriously came down to whoever would be the first person to take the fatal sip, and it could have been any of them. The investigators questioned the remaining three workers in the office that day, where one of the employees, Diane Harry, confessed a sneaking suspicion that she was supposed to be the intended target. Suddenly, some strange instances that had happened at Diane Harry's house were starting to make sense. Diane remembered that a few nights earlier, she was drinking scotch with her husband at home while watching TV. She claimed that when she tilted the glass to take the first sip, she thought it smelled off, and she became violently ill and stopped drinking it. She also recalled telling her husband that something was wrong with the tea kettle after she made herself coffee with it and the cream curdled. Oh, is that like a thing? Does cyanide make dairy curdle? Investigators tested the scotch from Diane's home and discovered a lethal amount of cyanide in it. And finally, they were hot on the trail. Diane's husband, Lewis, claimed he knew who their potential poisoner perp was. 43-year-old Roy Fitzpatrick, who was also their delivery man. So Lewis told them the story of how he'd accidentally made it onto Roy's shit list when he befriended Sharon, Roy's ex. While alone at a bar one night, Lewis struck up a conversation with 33-year-old Sharon Jones, who was also there alone. The two got to talking and had a lot in common, so they exchanged numbers to stay in contact. The investigators wanted to learn more about Sharon, so they asked Lewis for any details she'd given him about Roy. Lewis said Sharon and Roy had dated for a brief time, and she told him right away that Roy was the type of guy who wouldn't take no for an answer. She claimed that he would stalk her, choke her, and threaten her life if she ever decided to date anyone else. Lewis told Sharon she needed to get a restraining order against Roy, and even went down to the courthouse with her to help her file one. Unfortunately, the restraining order backfired. Roy was furious when he found out, and sent threatening letters to Lewis and Diane's house. In one of the letters, Roy said he was having a hard time with Lewis taking his wife from him, and he said he should take Diane away from him just so he could see how it feels. We pause for a brief reminder that women are not property that you can take from someone, and that they are their own person who can make decisions for themselves, and to think otherwise is archaically moronic, and also wrong. Anywho, the cops decided to pay a visit to Roy and see what he had to say for himself. At first, Roy denied having sent the letters, but a day later, he confessed he had. But he said it wasn't because of the restraining order, it was because Lewis was getting down with Sharon. And the cops were like, huh, you know, Lewis didn't mention that. When they questioned Sharon for her side of the story, she alleged that she and Lewis had met at a club and that she was in love with him. 
She said things moved very fast, and Lewis had asked Sharon to marry him once his divorce was finalized. And the cops were like, huh. You know, Lewis somehow didn't think to mention the divorce either. But Roy was a talented stalker, and after following Lewis home one night, he spotted Diane and realized the story of the divorce was a lie. Sharon received a call from Roy minutes after Lewis had left her place one night to break the news. He informed Sharon that Lewis was happily married, that his wife was still in the home, and that they weren't going through a divorce. But Sharon didn't believe it for a second. She thought that this was Roy's way of trying to get back at her and to get her to stop seeing Lewis. That was what the authorities had initially believed as well. But little did they know that Roy would drop a piece of info so hot and spicy that the course of the investigation was about to take off in an entirely new direction. The investigators brought up the threatening letters again and he was like, yeah, I sent the four letters, I'm sorry. And the cops were like, hold up, four letters, not seven? And Roy told them, no, just the four handwritten letters on the yellow paper. Immediately, the investigators showed him the three final and most threatening letters that the Harrys received. These three had been typed on white office paper and contained threats towards Diane specifically. Roy was adamant he hadn't written those ones, claiming they were forgeries. The authorities went back to the final three letters the Harrys received and re-examined them closely. They concluded that whoever had written the final letters was most likely the one who'd poisoned the water cooler, and Lewis was starting to look more suspicious by the second. Authorities got their big break when they discovered a distinct boo-boo with one of the envelopes of the typed letters. You know the spot on the back of an envelope where the four points meet in the middle? The points were offset with the right overlapping the left, and one of the points was folded a little. It's a simple enough manufacturing flaw that would come out of an assembly line, but for investigators, it would become the key piece of physical evidence in the case. They knew if they could prove who had bought the flawed envelope, they'd know who their poisoning perp was. Investigators got a warrant to search Lewis Harry's office at the community college where he was the PE teacher. They removed a large shelf from Lewis's office containing supplies and equipment to be looked through, and they also went through the trash can in his office. In the trash, they discovered a receipt from a company called Chemonic Scientific with a warning label about the dangers of cyanide on it. The signature on the receipt was from someone named Charles Hawley. The clerk at Chemonix remembered the man who'd purchased the cyanide. He was a student who claimed he needed it for a college chem class. But a quick search through the school system showed no student by that name. A handwriting analysis expert compared the signature from Charles Hawley against Lewis Harry's and discovered some similarities immediately. The capital H's in both of the last names were written in the exact same way. Where most people would write an H in three distinctive lines, picking up the pen in between each, the H's on these were written so the pen was only picked up twice. He went line, line, then cut his pen over diagonally to finish off the connecting dash. That might not seem like much on its own, but in the case of the two signatures, it was absolutely everything. The handwriting expert determined that with the distinctive H's, the right-leaning slant, and the circular movements of his pen, that the two signatures were absolutely written by the same person. Word to the wise when planning your forgeries, you can't just wing it. The investigators brought a photo of a lineup to the clerk and asked if he could identify which of the men he'd sold the chemical to. Of the six nearly identical looking men, the clerk picked out suspect number two as the person he'd helped that day, Lewis Harry. In Lewis's office, police discovered an open box of envelopes and saw that three of the remaining envelopes in the box had the same exact defect as the one that held one of the incriminating letters. Can you believe it? Usually an envelope with that sort of defect would have been pulled out for quality control purposes, but somehow those were missed. And in a one in a million chance, the defect made it into the box and would end up helping solve a crime. This helped them prove that Harry had sent at least one of the threatening letters to himself, and most likely the other two. And that shelf that they took out of Lewis's office? Turns out, the shelf contained traces of cyanide as well. Yeah, 
It's gonna be kind of hard to explain that one, eh? The next thing detectives had to figure out was how Lewis had gotten into the Transamerica office to poison the water supply. You needed a key card to access the office on the weekends. The log showed someone had used a key card to enter the building on Saturday morning, two days before Julie Williams was poisoned. The card belonged to Diane Harry. Diane insisted she hadn't gone into the office that weekend, and no one had reported seeing a woman enter the building around the time either. But an outside contractor who was waiting to get into the locked building that morning said an African-American man had pulled up sometime around 10 a.m. and swiped him into the building. The worker couldn't identify exactly which of the men in the lineup it was, but he remembered that the man drove a blue sports car with a tennis racket in the back. Lewis, of course, was an avid tennis player and a racket owner. Game, set, match. With that, Lewis was arrested and charged with the poisoning of Julie Williams, as well as the attempted poisoning of his wife, Diane Harry. And now came time for the age-old question of why. It's safe to assume after hearing about the affair with Sharon that perhaps Lewis's marriage wasn't going too well. Nearly a year after Julie's daughters made the devastating decision to pull the plug, Lewis took the stand. The prosecution presented that Lewis had been unhappy with his marriage to Diane after only three years together. And then one night, he met Sharon Jones. He lied to Sharon about his relationship status, and within three or four weeks, the proposition of marriage was already on the table. Roy learned about the relationship, mailed threatening letters to Lewis and Diane, and that's when Lewis realized he'd have the perfect alibi to get away with the unthinkable. Because after all, Diane had a $75,000 life insurance policy on her head. Lewis hatched a plan to poison his wife, pin it on Roy, put Roy away for life, and put a ring on Sharon. So Lewis typed up three more incriminating letters and mailed them to himself, but unknowingly used an envelope with a significant flaw in it that would ultimately tie him to the crime. In the end, Lewis was found guilty of poisoning Julie Williams, along with attempting to poison the other three co-workers, and was sentenced to life in prison. And there you have it. A tiny manufacturing error on an envelope exposed a man who was willing to end as many lives as possible if it meant the one person he intended it for ended up in their grave. That's a rather chilling, sociopathic thought. Good thing I have this flaming hot cauliflower wing wrap to warm myself up with. Thanks so much for watching, we really appreciate it. We'll see you next time? Okay, cool. See you then, bye.